Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Autodesk Virtual Academy today on the 8th of June. So uh, I'm Nigel Mbaik, your host today, um, and uh, unfortunately not your presenter today. We've got someone pretty awesome. We've got Nathan Elias in here um, from our technical team on with us. Hey, Nathan, how's it going? Good. How are you doing, Nigel? Good. Yeah, so Nathan is actually invisible here next to me. Um, no, he's actually not in the office today, but uh, he's still going to present for us. So that's a really good thing. Uh, as we notice, a ton of people have a mixed workflow between AutoCAD and Inventor, um, or they have legacy AutoCAD data that you know you don't want to lose. Uh, you worked for maybe decades even on some of this data. You want to make sure that you can leverage some of it moving into your 3D workflows um, and using Inventor in that case. Uh, so Nathan's kind of going to go over uh, how that works with the DWG underlay technology in Inventor. Uh, it was, correct me if I'm wrong, Nathan, but it was introduced in the 2016 version of software. That is correct. Yeah, and they've made a couple of improvements over the last two versions. So uh, we're going to go over those, how that all works. And uh, hopefully, you know, you definitely see some use cases for it today for you and your company. Uh, anything to add there, Nathan? Uh, nope, I'm going to be covering that during the presentation. Right. And I'm excited to, to show you guys this technology. Certainly. So if you do have any questions, uh, go ahead and post them in the chat panel. We've got a couple of people moderating the chat today. Um, so uh, we'll be able to answer your questions questions either immediately through like the chat options or uh, during the dedicated Q&A section at the end. Uh, feel free to ask any questions that might not be related to DWG underlay. My gosh, that's a handful or a mouthful. Um, as well, uh, we'll be able to answer those or even follow up with you after the presentation, be able to uh, get you the answers you need. So uh, with that, let's go ahead and get started and I'll uh, pass it on to you, Nathan. All right, awesome. Thanks, Nigel, appreciate that. So as Nigel said, a lot of you guys out there, a lot of customers, we have a ton of DWG data, or maybe uh, we work with suppliers or customers that constantly send us DWG data. And you know, the question is, how can I reuse that without having to you know, recreate sketches or recreate geometry in Inventor that already exists? And when Autodesk heard that, they came out with this DWG underlay technology, which I personally absolutely love. I think it's awesome technology. So I'm excited uh, to share that with you today in our presentation. Now, as far as my goals for this presentation, I really want to give you an overview and introductory look at what the DWG underlay functionality is. Um, you know, to give you a quick overview, it allows us to insert DWG files into either inventor parts or assemblies. Um, we can also then work with these DWG files inside of Inventor. Uh, we can move it around and get it get it located and situated correctly. Um, we can create sketches and we can pull that DWG information into our sketches so that we're not, you know, redrawing it over and over again. We don't want to redo work that already exists. Then we can associatively update 3D models with changes in AutoCAD. And, and that's really, I think, what's really cool about this is that you're not just, it's not just a one-way street where I can create my geometry and then I'm done, um, but I can actually have active workflows where I do some work in AutoCAD where it's a lot easier to make sense and use that to drive my geometry inside of Inventor. Um, and another way we can do that is by using the DWG as a skeleton for assemblies. So these are the, the different types of items that I'm going to show you during the demonstration today. Um, but before we get to the demonstration, just like Nigel said, I wanted to give you, you know, a few quick points about the DWG underlay technology. Um, this was introduced back with Inventor 2016. Um, as Nigel mentioned, each year since then, in the 2017 and the 2018 releases, they've been enhancing it and actively improving it and making it better. And after I do my demonstration, I'm going to kind of walk you through what functions you'll have based on the version of Inventor that you're using today. You know, unfortunately, if you're using 2015 or earlier, uh, you're not going to have access to these tools that I'm going to show you today. Uh, but once you get up to at least 2016, um, a portion of what I'm going to show you today at least will be available. Um, as I mentioned, this is really to create 3D inventor parts or assemblies for that matter that are associative to the source geometry, the source 2D AutoCAD data. And the nice thing is that inside of assemblies, how we typically use it is we use it as sort of a skeleton where you can create constraints and joints against, and that will let you um, easily locate your inventor models. So to demonstrate this, I'm going to do two different use cases. In our first use case, we're going to take an existing AutoCAD drawing. 
Um, and you can see this is, you know, maybe a simple AutoCAD drawing where we have some some drawing views here. We have some some uh, dimensions and annotations, and we have a title block. And I'm going to show you how you can bring that into Inventor, and then associatively create this this 3D model. I don't have a picture here, but I'm also going to show how you can use your DWG underlay information inside of a drawing. Uh, it's pretty neat how I think that was added in Inventor 2017 where you could do that. So I wanna make sure that you see how that's done. And then in our second use case, uh, we're going to look at how you could potentially use a DWG underlay as an assembly. So in this one, I have this drawing inside of AutoCAD that just shows how I want my loader bucket here to go together. And uh, you can see there's a couple of ribs here that are missing. So what we're going to do is I'm gonna bring those ribs in and we're going to use our DWG underlay as a skeleton to locate exactly where those where those uh, ribs go. And you're gonna be able to see how that works. And then, you know, I'm gonna change the location of the ribs and you're gonna see how it updates automatically. So without any further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, I wanted to first open up AutoCAD Mechanical to show you the first drawing that we're going to be working with. Um, this is just so you kind of have an idea of what this looks like inside of AutoCAD. And so now let's go ahead and inside of Inventor, I have this new part that I called 3D plate. And we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna start creating our geometry. So to import DWG information into Inventor, there's a couple of locations where I can access the tool. So right here on my 3D model tab, I can click on my import button or I can go to the tools tab, I'm sorry, the manage tab, and I also have the import button. So there's a couple different uh, places on our menu where we can access that. Now, once I click import, um, I can go ahead, I can scroll to, or I can navigate to wherever I have my DWG file and open it. And the first thing it's gonna ask is, you know, what plane do we wanna put this onto? Um, I, I want my top plane in our case to be my primary plane, so I'm gonna select that one. Then it's prompting us to specify the origin for the DWG drawing. So I'm gonna click there and you can see now we have it loaded into our part file. I'm gonna bring up the top view here and notice that uh, we, we did bring in our DWG geometry, but I, I have two problems with where I put it initially. Um, first of all, my drawing is upside down, which I don't really want it to be upside down. And the second issue I have is that if I notice the center point or the point of origin of my part is way up here and the geometry I wanna use is way down here. And um, you know, for example, we could put our point in the lower corner, but I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna put it in the middle of our hole in the center of our part. So how do I do that? Well, notice that when we put our DWG underlay, it shows up here inside of our model browser. So I can right click on that DWG underlay and I have a whole host of different options. Um, by default, as I mentioned, this is an associative connection to that AutoCAD drawing. Um, but if for some reason I don't want it to be associative, I can break that link right here in my right, right click menu. Now, what we wanna do is we wanna go ahead and translate it. So I'm gonna open the translate tool. And what that's gonna allow me to do is I'm first going to locate my origin of my part to be right here in the center of my top view. And then as I mentioned, it's upside down and I want my drawing to be rotated 180 degrees. So I'm just gonna grab that little handle that it shows on my screen and rotate it around. So now with that one command, I fixed both of those initial problems. You can see that now my point of origin of my part is in the center of the, the plate that I'm gonna be modeling. So I, I like where that's located and my drawing is oriented correctly. Now, inside of Inventor, I don't really want this title block. You know, I don't want um, some of these hidden lines in here. So notice that we have access to all of the AutoCAD layers right here inside of Inventor. And this lets me go in very quickly and to start deciding which elements I want and which elements I don't want to be shown. So I can turn off my hidden lines, my title block, and I can get down to just the information I want 
in order to turn this drawing into a 3D model. Now, in addition to that, notice that right now I'm in a top view, and this is going to be my front view, and this you know, would be a right side view, if you will. So since I'm in my top view, all I really want to see is just my top view portion. So in 2017, they added the ability for us to crop the DWG. So I can just go in here and say, you know, in this particular view, that's all the information I want to see. And then it's going to crop out all of the other information that I don't need. So uh, for our first part, as we create geometry, I don't really need my dimensions. So I'm going to go ahead and turn my dimensions back off here. And now I'm left with just the geometry I want to start creating uh, sketches inside of Inventor. So how do we create sketches or how do we use this information, I should say, to create sketches that will let us create our model? So I can go ahead and um, we're going to pick my top plane here. And then I'm going to start my sketch. And with Inventor 2016, they added this new command on our project geometry menu. It's called Project DWG Geometry. So when I activate that, I get this little mini toolbar. And if I hover over these options, I have the option to either project single items, connected geometry, or if I have blocks, I can select blocks. And to show you an example of what each of those look like, if I'm in single geometry mode, notice that I can project single entities like uh, lines, arcs, circles, and so forth inside of my drawing. If I select connected geometry, it's going to infer different lines that are connected together and give me different options. And then blocks, if I don't have any blocks, then nothing will show up. Uh, you know, I can't select anything. Um, you can see here in my AutoCAD file, I did select my perimeter. I created my perimeter as a block. So I'm gonna go ahead and select that and notice that it turns yellow, which means that I've projected it into my sketch that I'm currently creating. And then I'll also go ahead and I'll select this uh, middle hole. And that's all the geometry that I want for this. Um, in 2018, by the way, if you do select the auto project geometry, uh, we now support that. Uh, but for this example, I'm just going to manually select what I want to project into each of the sketches that I create. So, now, the way I designed this, you can see that my front plane is actually in the center of my part. So let me scroll this around so you can see it a little bit better. And I actually want a plane here on the front of my part where I'm going to put my front view. So what I'm going to do with this front plane selected, I'm just going to go ahead and create a par parallel plane through a point, And I'm going to pick the point at the front of my part. Now, at this point, I want to bring in another copy of my DWG underlay so I can place it on my front plane. Um, we need a new copy for each different plane that you want to put your DWG underlay onto. Um, I can go through the same process where I click import and I can import it again. Or they've added a shortcut where I can right click the DWG underlay in my model browser and I can just say add an instance. And when I add an instance, again, notice that I'm prompted for another new plane. In this case, we're going to pick the front plane. And then I'm prompted for a new plane of origin. And I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to select the center line of our bottom face there. So now notice it's inserted another new copy. And what I also want to point out is that whatever, whatever changes I make to one instance of my DWG underlay, it makes the changes to the other ones as well as far as layer vi visibility is concerned. So if I turn on dimensions, um, it's going to turn on dimensions, not in just the underlay that I have active, but all of my underlays. So I'm going to go ahead and turn on the dimensions. Uh, let me flip to a front view. Um, we need to crop this out because all we need for our front view is just this little portion right here. So let's go ahead and, and crop it. And then just like we did before, I want this to be located here where my other part is, um, and I want it to be on the center. Uh, let me just real quickly get rid of the, the dimensions again to make this just a little bit easier to see. So now I want to go ahead and I want to translate this just like I did the other one. We want this to be with our insertion point. 
we want it to be rotated around 180 degrees. And I could type that in if I wanted to. I'm just doing it with the uh, drag and drop method. And now once I place that, you'll see that I basically have my sketches lined up how they would be oriented with respect to each other in 3D, where I have my top view on my top plane, I have my front view on my front plane, and I have them lined up together. So just to make this a little bit easier to see, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna hide the, the um, top view. And we're going to go ahead and create a sketch on our front work plane right here. And then I'll hide that to get that out of the way. And just like we did before, I'm gonna use my project DWG geometry tool. Um, and this time I'm gonna select the option for connected geometry. And I'm gonna just select the perimeter or the outside of my, my uh, part right there. So now if I finish my sketch, um, if I hide my DWG underlay and I show my sketches, you'll see that we basically use our DWG file to quickly come in and get my sketches set up so I can start creating my part. Now at this point, we can start extruding, we can start revolving, sweeping, you know, the typical type of features that we create with Inventor. So what I'm gonna do, you know, I could extrude this first or I could extrude this face first. I'm gonna pick this face. And notice that instead of saying, hey, I want to extrude this a certain distance, I'm gonna set a reference to this point in my DWG underlay. And that will create an associative link back to it so that when I update my DWG underlay, my geometry will update along with it. So now when I click OK, we have our first feature ready. You can see that we're now starting to turn that 2D DWG geometry into 3D models. Um, then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take the other sketch that I've created. I'm going to create another extrusion. And uh, this time I'm going to use um, a function that you know maybe you're familiar with, maybe you're not. Um, instead of a cut, which would only leave me with these two solid pieces right here, I'm going to select this intersect option. And what that essentially does is it takes my profile, it moves it through the part, and whatever part of this geometry that falls within this profile it keeps, and it cuts or gets rid of everything else. So in this situation, it's a very um, easy, fast way for me to make these cuts without having to create a new sketch and to be able to do that in one, one fell swoop. So now let's look at how we can start projecting and using more of our DWG underlay to finish this out and create some additional features. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn the visibility back on so that we can see what we're doing on the backside. And um, actually first, let me come in the front side. This is where we want our holes. So I can go ahead and create a sketch there. And I just wanted to show you another you know, tip or trick when you're working with Inventor that you may or may not be aware of. But when I go in to project this geometry, I'm gonna select these holes. And notice that right now I can't see the holes. So it doesn't look like I really did anything. But if I turn around, I can see there my holes are on that front face where I'm creating my sketch. Now inside of Inventor, um, there is a way that we can control that. If I go to my tools menu and my applications option and I go to my sketch, um, notice that we have this little option down here on sketch display. If I move this over and click apply, then it's going to show my sketch entities through the part, regardless of whether or not geometry blocks my sketch plane view. So if that's something that you're interested in doing, it's a nice little tip and trick um, to make it easier to understand. So I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna finish my DWG proje projection. I'm gonna go ahead and project these other two holes and we'll go ahead and we'll finish up that sketch. So now we wanna go ahead and we wanna create those holes real fast. So we'll use the hole tool. We'll select those sketch points. And now instead of having to go in and say, you know, how big is that hole? Um, what I can essentially do is just say, let's measure the diameter of that hole and it will automatically set them to be the right, the right um, diameter. So now I'm just gonna go and I'm gonna, instead of projecting this on the front face, this last hole, I'm going to just project right here on the back face. Gonna open up the hole tool again and create that hole real fast. And then I want to show 
that another another thing that you can do is we can use the geometry that we've created and we can combine it with regular inventor type features. So if I wanna create a circular pattern, I can go in and select that hole, rotate it around my center axis here. Um, in this case, you can see I need seven holes instead of the default six. So when I change that to seven, I, I now have this part the way I need it. All right, so at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and save my part and I wanna show how we can use this now inside of a drawing. So if I go ahead and, uh, and, and before we go to the drawing, I'm gonna do one thing real quick. I'm gonna to go to my layer visibility and I'm gonna turn on my dimensions so that they show up. Um, and then I'm gonna go and I'm gonna hide this so that it doesn't show up in my 3D view. But, but we have those, those layers turned on. Now, I have the option, I can go in here and I can create dimensions right here if I want, or I can take advantage of the fact that we have this three, 3D, or I'm sorry, this 2D underlay in my part. And notice that if I go here under my model to that DWG underlay, I can right click, select include, and now it's actually going to display whatever layers I have visible for my DWG underlay. And it's also going to respect the cropping that I did to show just the part of the DWG underlay that's pertinent to my view. And I'm gonna go and I'm gonna do that to my other view here. Here's my, my other view and here's that DWG underlay. I'm gonna right click and select include and it's gonna include those dimensions as well. So now let's see what happens when I go back to my AutoCAD drawing and I'm gonna make a few little changes. So I'm gonna take this, this center hole right here and instead of it being 80, I'm gonna change that value to 60 for our radius. And then I'm gonna come down here to my bottom view and I'm going to move these two. I'm basically gonna uh, make this thicker by 25 millimeters. Then of course I'll stretch this back out so that everything connects properly inside of AutoCAD. Um, and then we're also going to fix this dimension so that it shows up correctly. All right, so you can see I just made a few quick changes to my DWG. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna save that. And now notice that when I go back to Inventor, I'm gonna go back to my part first. Um, notice that we have these little lightning symbols next to the, our DWG underlays. And that's to indicate to us that it's been updated and we need to refresh our part or update our part to reflect those changes. Now notice that it, it made those changes appropriately just like we told it to. And um, now if I go back to my drawing, um, it also automatically updates with those changes as well. And uh, it looks like I accidentally also moved the center here. Let me move that back. Let me resave it, go back to Inventor and update it again so that it shows up correctly. And so now you can see that any of those changes that we make back in our AutoCAD file, um, as soon as I update those, they get updated inside of Inventor. So one great use case for that is, you know, I know a lot of our customers sometimes have very intricate profiles that they need to extrude. And you could create those in AutoCAD where it's, you know, maybe it's easier to create those, uh, those type of extruded profiles. And you can bring those into your sketch environment and use them directly without having to re redraw them inside of Inventor. So now I wanna go to my second use case that I wanted to show. And, and this, this is the bucket loader. And as I mentioned, we want to go ahead and um, put some ribs on here. Now, if I'm using Inventor 2017 or Inventor 2016, um, the only way I can use DWG underlays inside of assemblies is by putting them into a part first and then using it in the assembly. Um, in 2018, I can bring it in direct and I'll show you that in just a minute. Um, but for now, I'm gonna show you the method um, that would have to be used again if you're in Inventor 2016 or 2017. So here I opened up that part, and this is just a blank part that I had put inside of my assembly where I have my origin point right here. And I'm going to import 
my bucket underlay drawing um, very similarly to how I did it um, in my previous example. So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm going to uh, put it on my front plane this time because that's the way I, I have it set up in my assembly. And uh, then just like we did before, we're gonna go and we're going to translate it so that my origin lines up with the center of my, my um, part right here. So now that I've done that, when I go back to my assembly, notice that my DWG overlay or underlay um, now shows up right where I have this bucket selection part located. So if I go to the back, you can see I have it lined up with my model. Now, I wanna go ahead and use this to locate a couple of ribs that we're going to insert. So I'm gonna to go to my assemble tab and we're going to insert this bucket rib that I have created. I'm going to go ahead and put in a couple of different instances. And then I'm going to use my constraint tool to um, quickly attach the ribs to the right geometry right here inside of my bucket. And I'm going to need to do that twice. Let me select that surface along with this surface. So at this point now you can see that I have both of my ribs on my model and you can see that they're attached to that but I can move them uh, sideways and I can move them up and down. So now I wanna constrain them so I, I can't move them sideways and up and down. So I'm gonna create some constraints, but this time I'm gonna create constraints in relation to my DWG underlay. And notice that I can just select those surfaces that I want them to be connected to and line it right up with my DWG underlay. So now if I look at my model, I've constrained it from moving sideways, but I can still move it up and down. So now we're going to go ahead, we're gonna constrain it completely. I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna turn on that constraint tool again. Uh, I'm gonna line it up to the bottom of my DWG underlay geometry right there. Uh, this one is this rib right here. And now by using my DWG underlay, I have them located exactly where I want them to be, as you can see in that view. And if I try to move my geometry, it's completely constrained, so it can't move anywhere. Now, let's go ahead and um, note it. And what I wanna do is I'm gonna open up that DWG underlay. Uh, notice that I can go right here. I can say open up inside of AutoCAD. And so it's gonna open that up um, right here in my AutoCAD instance that I had open. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna just quickly move these ribs over. Um, so I'll just move these over like uh, 80 millimeters that way. Then I will move my other rib uh, 80 millimeters this way. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna save that. And now again, if I go back to my inventor assemble, or first of all, if I go back to my inventor part where I have my DWG underlay inserted, you'll notice that again, it alerts us that we need to update our part. So I'm gonna update that. And then when I go back to the assembly and I hit update, uh, notice that my ribs now move and they are associated to that underlay and their location updates um, just as we expected. Now, I'm not gonna go through that whole exercise again, but I did wanna show that in Inventor 2018, um, instead of uh, being required to bring it into another part, um, as I mentioned, right from my place command, I can go here and I can say, insert the DWG file. Um, I can go ahead and I can select it and I can bring it directly into my assembly without being required to put it into a part first. So let's go back to our, our PowerPoint here. And I just wanted to, um, again, reiterate what capabilities and functions are gonna be available depending on which version of Inventor that you're going to be using. So with Inventor 2016, that's when that project DWG geometry command was added in the sketch environment inside of Inventor. And so that will be available in you know, 2016 through 2018. Um, you'll also in 2016 be able to control the visibility of your layers. 
um, you'll be able to reposition and move around your DWG so that you can you can line it up between your your part and your drawing itself. You, you can also in an assembly create joints, constraints, and assemble command, and you can reference that DWG geometry that you project. And it's associative when you make changes to the DWG um, back to your model inside of Inventor. So that's all part of Inventor 2016. Now with 2017, they added the capabilities that you saw with the drawings inside of Inventor, where you can actually include DWG underlay information in your drawing views. That's also where they added the ability to crop the DWG underlays where um, you can focus on just the portion that you want for the specific instance that you've placed in your part or your assembly. Um, they also have associative placement. So if in a model, um, my, my origin point that I put it in, if that changes around based on geometry changes I make, it'll actually move your DWG underlay around along with the model changes. Um, it also came up with an easy way to redefine the DWG placement. So 2016, if you wanna change it, you might have to delete it and replace it. Whereas in 2017, I can hit the redefine command and pick a new plane and a new insertion point. Um, and then they added that nice right click menu where you can add a new instance. Um, they added that little shortcut inside of Inventor 2017 as well. Now talking about the capabilities in Inventor 2018, um, this is now where you can insert DWG files directly into assemblies. You know, the method I showed you works in 2016 and 2017, where you put it in a part, and then you use the DWG underlay in that part to control information at the assembly level. Um, also in 2018, they gave you the ability to insert multiple DWG underlays. And by that, I'm not talking about multiple instances. I'm talking about um, if I have three different actual AutoCAD DWG drawings that I wanna put in a part or an assembly, I can now do that in 2018. Um, in 2017 or 2016, you can only have one DWG drawing that you use as your, your underlay. But now in 2018, I can, I can insert multiple copies or multiple drawings. Um, we also have that nice little open in AutoCAD shortcut that I showed you at the very end. Um, that was added to 2018 and Autodesk added support for the auto project options in your, your application options where it can automatically project DWG information into your sketches. So just a quick summary of you know, what, we, what we reviewed and went over in today's presentation and demonstration. Uh, we showed how you can use and you can take advantage of all that rich DWG AutoCAD information that you have and you can bring that information into Inventor Parts and Assemblies. Uh, we showed how you have control over where your DWG is located, what layers are visible, um, cropping. There's a lot of information that you can control. We looked at how you use the DWG project command inside of the sketch environment to quickly um, convert the DWG underlay information into sketch entities that Inventor can use. And then we showed you how that's associative. So when we make changes to our DWG file, that automatically gets updated inside of our inventor file and passes through. Although again, if you want, you can break that link if you prefer. And then finally, we showed how in the context of an assembly, we can use DWG underlays to create constraints, uh, to create joints and to see how you can use them as kind of a skeleton to control placements of components inside of your assembly. So that concludes our presentation today. Uh, like I said, it's a very exciting technology. If you guys are using AutoCAD or you have an, a lot of AutoCAD data, um, this opens up some new potential workflows that may help you to become more efficient in the way that you create and the way that you generate designs. So with that said, I will turn the time back over to Nigel. And again, I appreciate you guys taking time to be with me on my presentation today. Certainly, and thanks Nathan for that. Um, we do have some questions here. Let me go ahead and go through a couple of them. Um, there was a question about adding DWG information to IDWs, which we did show. 
Um, but I just want to clarify, Nathan, um, when you brought over that layer information from AutoCAD into the uh, into the IDW environment, so uh, the dimensioning and the, the symbols as well, um, that all of that information, just to clarify, um, and Nathan, correct me if I'm wrong, all of that is coming from AutoCAD. You can't necessarily go in Inventor and edit any of those dimensions or add any special symbols you want to. Um, and things like styles and stuff are coming directly from AutoCAD. Is that correct? That, that's correct. So if you wanted to make any changes to how that looks on the drawing, you'd actually make those changes in AutoCAD and then they would be updated inside of Inventor. So I, I don't want you to think you can't make changes to them. You definitely can. Um, but you are correct that you would do that in AutoCAD and then that would then that would get pushed back through to the Inventor drawing. Certainly, certainly. Um, and then uh, another question here relating to the uh, using the measure tool to set the drill hole size um, on those parts um, when you went over that block there. Uh, when using that measure tool, Nathan, uh, do you know whether or not that measure tool stays dynamic in regards to any edits in the hole or in the sketch size, or if that's static to that one time you measured? Yeah, and that's a great question. It is, it is actually static to that one measurement that I use. So for example, if I change those whole size in my AutoCAD drawing, um, those would not update dynamically. If I wanted them to update with my DWG file, then I would probably wanna take an approach instead of using the whole tool where I create it as an extrude. Because if I created it as an extrude, then any changes to the whole size inside of AutoCAD would associatively update. So, so that's a great question. Certainly, yeah. So just to clarify, um, for those who didn't catch that, um, instead of using the whole command, just use the extrude tool and sketch, I'm assuming, the outside diameter, Nathan. Um, and then that sketch with the outside diameter will remain, will remain associative to any changes you make on the AutoCAD end of things. Right. Yeah. All right. Um, we're getting a bunch of thanks and awesome presentations. Those aren't questions, but just want to let you know, Nathan, that people are definitely happy. Uh, <laughs> No, I appreciate that. Like I said, I, I love this functionality. I think it's awesome. You know, it seems like every company has DWG data lying around or they have customers that supply DWG data to them. And, you know, one of their questions is always, well, what do I do with it? Because I use Inventor. I don't use AutoCAD that much. Or, or maybe they do use AutoCAD. Um, and, and so this gives you an, a fantastic, easy way to take that geometry and start using it right away inside of Inventor. Certainly, and hopefully this this convinces some of those people who are still on maybe 2015 and 2014 to start moving forward um, to get functionality like this. And if any of these functionalities seem kind of similar to what we did last week, um, it is because it is using the same AnyCAD technology, um, even though it's called DWG Underlay in this case, to bring in that information um, from AutoCAD into uh, Inventor, similarly as it is to bring things like SOLIDWORKS and step files into Inventor. Um, it all came out at the same time. Uh, Jerry, I'm um, asking about how to get the slides. Um, we won't be able to send the slides to you. If anything, this is all being recorded and put on our YouTube channel. Um, so you can look there later to see uh, exactly what you need. But if you do need the slides, let us know in the survey afterwards and we can get that sent over to you via email. And uh, this is coming, a question from Corey. If you move a view in your AutoCAD file, uh, will it model incorrectly when you update the underlay in Inventor? Um, so again, remember that when we are placing it, we're, we're placing it in conjunction with the, uh, so like when I place it in my, my Inventor part file first, um, when I pick that insertion point, it's basically taking the AutoCAD 00, zero world coordinate and it's placing that with wherever I put my insertion point. And that's why I typically always had to move my AutoCAD model um, by changing the location of that, that, um, that point when I use that locate tool. So as long as um, you relate it to the geometry in AutoCAD, then you shouldn't have a problem after you move it in AutoCAD. Um, but even if it does move it at worst case, it's very easy to go in and just quickly update that that location inside of Inventor. So um, e either way, it's not that big of a deal to get it back in sync with the where you want it inside of Inventor. Certainly, certainly. Um, another question, can you do uh, DWG underlay with the 3D AutoCAD model? You know what, I haven't tested that out. So I, I wouldn't be able to answer that at this point, um, but that's definitely something that we can look at 
and and maybe get back to you on certainly i don't think it comes in three dimensions um yeah i, I think remember. it's I, I mean i i know when I, i've seen in other tools where when you insert autocad geometry as 3d it does kind of show the outline of your 3d geometry um, but i'm not sure the the project command I'm not sure if it recognizes, you know, 3D edges and different entities like that. So that's something that would have to um, explore and then potentially get back to you on. But sure. my gut feeling is that it's really made more for 2D geometry in AutoCAD. Yeah, and I, I agree with the, the same sentiment there. Um, I think that if you did just need AutoCAD 3D, or if you had a 3D AutoCAD solid, you wanted to bring that into Inventor, there's other workflows to do things like that. Um, not necessarily to use that underlay technology. Most of the times, I think you'll just generate a 3D file out of AutoCAD um, and bring that dumb solid into Inventor. Um, does that make sense? That, do you agree in that sense, Nathan? Uh, yeah, that's true. All right, cool. Um, and then another question, can you uh, select the dimensions in the underlay to run your extrudes, holes, and modeling features? Um, I think that could be answered by the layers turning on and off. Just correct me if I'm wrong here, Corey. Um, I, don't, I don't think you can turn certain objects off in layers. Um, you can just turn the entire layer on and off. You can also just alter that in AutoCAD, on the AutoCAD side of things. Um, but I don't think you can select certain objects in certain layers to turn on and off. Is that correct, Nathan? That is correct. It's, it's the whole layer or none of it. It's, it's either or. You can't select independent entities like a, a dimension and right click it and say hide this or anything like that. Right. Um, people are asking where can I get recorded uh, videos for this presentation. Um, there are being this is being recorded right now. So like I say every week, hi mom, if you're watching this later, and uh, it's going to be on our YouTube channel this afternoon probably. That's uh, Kativ or YouTube.com forward slash Kativ Technologies, or if you just search Kativ AVA. It, on YouTube, you'll be able to find an entire playlist of maybe our like 85 or so videos at this point. Uh, does adding or removing layers in AutoCAD translate to the underlay? Yes. Again, as long as you don't break that associative link, um, any changes you make to that AutoCAD drawing um, will pass through to the inventor side as well. Right. And Nathan said you can uh, break that link. So if you right click the underlay, um, similarly to any links you create with imported geometry, you can suppress the link or you can break it entirely um, and it should work that way. Uh, and question is, how does this work with Vault? Does it grab the, uh, the AutoCAD DWG as well um, and check that in or how does that process work, Nathan? Um, yes, it does grab, you know, it, it knows that it has that dependency and so it, it does become a dependency just like any, you know, other external file would become a dependency. And um, it should pick that up and bring that in. I haven't tested it 100%. Jonathan, I know you're on. Have you tested that by chance? Yes, I have. Yeah, so it it, it will actually grab that the, um, that drawing and pull it in with your check-in. So it, it looks at it as a children or a child item of the, of the uh, of the part itself. Yeah, and by the way, I had Jonathan on the phone. He's another one of our technical specialists here at Kativ, and uh, he, he's worked with this extensively as well. So I, I had him join us to help with any questions in case something like that came up. Certainly, certainly. And um, there are some people asking about that workflow to go from 3D AutoCAD into Inventor. Um, Nathan or Jonathan, do you want to elaborate a little bit on what it would take to get a 3D model from AutoCAD into Inventor, whether it's a dumb solid or exactly what you get out of it? So DWG underlay is strictly uh, 2D elements. So AutoCAD 2D elements, it, it does not work currently with, uh, you know, 3D models. Um, if you were to project, right, uh, inside the AutoCAD, uh, there's a number of tools that can get a flat shot of a 3D model in 2D geometry. That would work as an underlay. Certainly, certainly. Thanks, John. Are, are there um, other ways, Jonathan, that you can get 3D models? And I, I know with Factory Design Suite, you know, it, it will bring in some 3D information. Um, so it sounds like someone's asking, they have 3D geometry in AutoCAD and they want that inside of Inventor. I, you know, you can always export from AutoCAD into standard formats like IGIS. Um, that's probably the best way at this point. Yeah, IGIS or Steps is probably the best way to carry things over um, and then just import that into AutoCAD. Obviously you have no design in, or in, into Inventor. You'll have no design intent, so you won't see 
similarly to bring like SOLIDWORKS files into Inventor, you'll get the same kind of information. It'll just be a, a brick solid, a dumb solid per se. Um, but at least you'll get that geometry in if you needed like that representation in your Inventor model for some reason. Um, and Radu uh, from Benson, hey, how's it going? Um, mentions that, hey, it does work really great in Vault. They use it all the time. Um, that's, that's good to hear for sure that people are definitely leveraging this technology to um, either uh, merge the two worlds of 2D and 3D. You don't necessarily have to choose one or the other or to use some of that old 2D legacy data to be able to generate 3D geometry on um, some of this older stuff that maybe you're not editing anymore. Maybe it's a part that you've been using for the last 15 years that you originally started in, you know, say R12 AutoCAD. Um, you just need to make a 3D representation and uh, you can do that in this way. So Jonathan or Nathan, just this is a question that I have. Um, do you know how this works with any of the special objects in any of the AutoCAD verticals? So things like uh, special civil 3D objects or um, things like point clouds and stuff? Yeah, so since they're all based on, you know, an AutoCAD platform, as long as that is a AutoCAD object, right, as a, if you can select those objects and manipulate them the same way that you would any other, um, you know, sketch object, line object, things like that, blocks, right, um, all of those elements can be used as a underlay, but they all have to be 2D elements. Okay, makes sense. Cool. Um, so I think that's everything for questions. If uh, anyone thinks of anything else, feel free to shoot us an email at questions at .com or uh, give us a call and uh, we'll definitely be able to uh, answer those for you. Uh, again, like I mentioned, this recording is going to be available on our YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash technologies. That should be up later this afternoon if you need to catch up or maybe you missed a bit of the presentation so you can watch it over again. Um, so yeah, with that, uh, I'd like to thank Nathan and I'd like to thank Jonathan Creek for being on this morning. Uh, it is definitely a, a great resource that we have here for you to both to be on our webcast this morning. All right, thank you everyone. Yep, and uh, just to, to let you all know, uh, next week we're gonna be doing a Vault Security AVA. Um, we're gonna be going over uh, security features both on the user end um, and on the file end. So maybe if you are a new Vault admin or just want a refresher on some of those tools and capabilities in regards to um, securities in Vault, uh, Mike Carlson will be on with us next week going over a couple of those things. So, uh, you know, definitely uh, join us next week. Same time, same place, 10 o'clock on Thursday. So uh, with that, I'll leave you all and uh, we'll see you all next time. Thank you.